Good evening and uh, good Friday. Hello, everyone. Yes, we can hear you, Ellie. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I just want to say a brief welcome to everyone who is joining us for what I am thinking potentially the most fun <laughs> of all the lectures we've had at the old schoolhouse series. So. Welcome again, everyone. I'm Gabacha Moreno. I'll be your host tonight on behalf of the Desert Institute. If you are new to the series, the Old School House Lecture Series is a partnership between the 29 Palms Historical Society and the Desert Institute. The series began about 17 years ago, and tonight's program is one of 10 monthly lectures discussions that we hold on the second Fridays of the month. And before we officially begin, I just want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge the indigenous peoples who have stewarded the land that we are on for time immemorial. So for Joshua Tree National Park, I would like to acknowledge the Mojave, Kawiya, Serrano, and Chemehuevi peoples, 
I also want to acknowledge the Hikari Apache and the Pueblo peoples of Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I am tuning in from. And for the Historical Society, I, I want to acknowledge the Serrano Chemuevi and the 29 Palms of Mission Indians. Um, before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping uh, rules that I want to share with everyone. We encourage participation, so please use the chat, tell us your thoughts, just be nice to each other. If you have questions, we'll leave those for the end of the presentation, so you can use that little ask a question button that you see on the screen and submit your questions that way. If we get disconnected, please wait and refresh your browser and we'll be doing all the troubleshooting on our end that we can. So we, we can promise you we'll be back as soon as possible. And if you experience an issue, there's a little help button at the top of the chat and you can click there and it can guide you through different scenarios of how to troubleshoot on your end. If you do that and you still experience some issues, feel free to uh, share on, in the chat. So if other folks are having the same issues, then I will prompt our presenter to stop and make some time to fix whatever is going on. And then we can continue and hopefully um, at least most of us will be able to see the presentation well. A replay of the event will be available to everyone who's registered. But if you want access to a fabulous resource that Ellie put together for us, which has all the embedded videos into the presentation, I dropped at the top of the chat a little message. You can email um, desertinstitute at joshuatree.org and with a small donation, we'll be, make that resource available to you. And without much further ado, I'm going to pass it on to you, Ellie, so you can present yourself and tell us what we are in for tonight. Well, um, I don't know what you're in for, but I'm in for a good time. So I hope you'll all come along. Um, we were listening to Sonny Boy Williamson perform Sloppy Drunk Blues which is an old standard in which the man is singing about he'd rather be home sloppy drunk in bed than out on the streets running from the man. My name is Ellie Greenwood Cordes, and I'm a retired associate professor of anthropology and American studies from Palomar College in San Diego County. And I welcome you to the Booze Brothers or Halfway to Concord, a brief history of alcohol in America. It's my hope that as we move this party along, you'll be able to see how the history of alcohol in America is the result of great sweeping tides of history set in motion long before the first colonists ever walked ashore. So I hope you have enough of your favorite beverage to sustain you as we distill the facts and concoct a stirred and not shaken version of American history because really, we don't wanna bruise the history. Ancient Mexico is our first stop, so grab yourself an agave beer and let's join the pulque party that's already in full swing. Oh. Gabby, we're missing an, an image here. Hmm. We're missing a bunch of images. Interesting. Here. Why aren't they loading? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let me see if I can go back and catch them again. Maybe they'll cooperate this time. Okay. If not, I can show it from my screen because I can see it um, okay. over here. Do you want to try that? Let me yeah. close up your video. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We are working to show you. Okay, can you see it? There we go. Perfect. So let me go to here. There we are. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> The question is, when did Native Americans begin to enjoy booze? 
And it seems to me that the best way to get an understanding of that is to look for the liquor that has the greatest time depth in America. And that is a beer made out of the great blue agave plant. And the beer is called Pulque. Now the picture that we're looking at is a picture of an Aztec pulque drinking party. And I love this picture for its wealth of rich detail and the eternal human story it tells. The picture was painted in about 1550 AD by an Aztec artist who was commissioned by a Catholic priest who was concerned that the details of pre-contact Aztec life would be lost to posterity. In this case, the artist chose to depict a pulque drinking party, an activity restricted to the noble and priestly classes. In this image, we see two noble men and three noble women, and we can read the signs of their nobility easily. Their hairstyles are extravagant, their ornaments are royal blue in color, their garments are finely tailored, their jewelry is made of precious materials, and they are being served from very expensive ceramics. In the center of the room is a large ceramic olla. Bubbles of fermentation have vigorously overtopped the pot. The partiers are dressed all in white. Their garments are made of the fibers of the agave plant, and the ceramic olla containing the pulque rests on a stabilizing ring twisted from agave fibers highlighting the importance of agave in many aspects of life. Everyone appears to be having a great time and to enjoy having their noses tickled by the pulque bubbles. Everyone that is, except the woman in the lower right corner. She's had more than her limit and has passed out cold. She's lying on the floor and her bowl of pulque has spilled into her lap and onto her skirt. Her hairdo has fallen apart and her eyes are focused on something only she can see. The history of Pulque is the history of Mayapuel, the goddess of the blue agave. The story says that when Mayapuel was buried, the first agave grew from her grave. The oldest descriptions of Mayapuel date from 2,500 years ago, so we know that Pulque consumption is very ancient. To make pulque, the sap of the agave is allowed to sit overnight, and it soon ferments into a mild beer called pulque that ounce for ounce has about the alcohol content of an American beer. Pulque can be further processed and made into a kind of wine called mezcal, often sold with a worm in the bottle. No matter if people eat the worms, throw them away, or maintain a collection of worms they have known, they all understand the worms are a kind of certificate of authenticity, since those worms rely only on the agave to complete their life cycles. The final incarnation of agave sap is tequila. Tequila was first made by Europeans who were used to the strong distilled liquors of Europe. Distilling agave sap concentrates the essential elements giving tequila drinkers a mildly hallucinogenic glow. The winds of change upended the Aztec system of pulque consumption, and now anyone with the price can drink pulque. And the winds of change did not neglect Europeans, as we shall see in the next story. Even if the first colonists had known about pulque, they would have continued drinking beer and whiskey because they were caught in a sweeping tide of history. And this is how it happened. In the summer of 1257 AD, life in the northern latitudes was good enough to expand. Even the Vikings had established <clears throat> colonies in North America and Greenland. But within six months, all that flipped on its head. And by the winter of 1258 AD, the little ice age clutched the northern latitudes in its icy grip. Crop failures and incomparable cold caused the deaths of one third of the residents of London that winter. Along with the deaths of humans and animals, the drop in temperature killed every grapevine and nearly every fruit tree in the north. 
the cold drove wine production from Northern Europe southward into the current wine grape growing areas of France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Madeira, and Greece. What caused the cold temperature to develop so suddenly? No one understood what had happened. The church concluded the cold was a punishment from God upon a sinful people. If this was a punishment from God, then God is a big angry volcano called Samalas located in Indonesia. When Samalas exploded in, 15, in 1257, it threw an enormous amount of sunlight blocking dust so high into the atmosphere that it took 560 years or until 1815 for the golden rays of sunlight to break through again and free the River Thames from freezing solid in wintertime. The loss of wine grapes was upsetting for the Northerners, but they were resourceful and determined not to adopt sobriety just because their grape vines and fruit trees froze and died. Reliant upon what could survive the colder temperatures, Northern Europeans began to ferment barley to make beer. They also began to distill fermented barley and rye to make whiskey. It's possible to draw a straight line between the explosion of the Somalis volcano and the fact that beer sales outpaced wine sales in the United States in 2021. The first colonists to North America, north of Mexico, were from Northern Europe, and they brought a love of beer and whiskey instead of wine with them, and this made beer and whiskey the dominant drinks in colonial America. If the first colonists had been from the southern areas of Europe, they would have brought a love of wine and brandy with them, and those beverages would probably be dominant. If Somalis had not exploded at all, then the first immigrants, no matter if they were from northern or southern Europe, would have been rooted in a winemaking tradition, and Americans today would be buying more wine than beer rather than the other way around. The influence of the Little Ice Age prevailed for centuries. 200 years after its end in 1992, Americans still consumed 20% more beer than wine. In 2016, beer and wine consumption equalized, but in 2018, wine consumption dropped off again, and now more beer than wine is sold. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, we're just going to have to wait and see. Dateline Atlantic Ocean, November 11th, 1620. The pilgrims were weary and thirsty. At sea for nearly two months and off course from their original destination of Virginia, they had a life and death problem on their hands. They were very, very low on beer. The beer supply for passengers was gone, and the supply for the crew was nearly half gone. No joke. Shipboard water was unsafe to drink, but the fermentation that produces beer kills the organisms that cause food poisoning. The crew of the Mayflower needed the remaining supply of beer for the return trip to England in the spring, and so Captain Christopher Jones ordered the ship brought to ground off Cape Cod and forced the pilgrims headed by John Bradford to slake their thirst by going ashore to drink water. The log of the Mayflower says, quote, the pilgrims were hastened ashore and made to drink water, that the seamen might have the more beer, close quote. No one drank water in Europe because waterways were used as open sewers. This caused the pilgrims to retain their suspicions of the local water, even though in the Americas, the native people engaged in strict sanitation practices. Soon the pilgrims were suffering from alcohol withdrawal and they exhorted Bradford to beg for more beer. Scholars say that Bradford was negotiating, but he had nothing to negotiate with. So in response, Captain Jones replied that there was no beer for Bradford, quote, not even if he were their own father, close quote. When we think of the pilgrims, we usually think of religious freedom and Plymouth Rock. Now we need to expand our understanding of the pilgrims to add to their impressive list of firsts, that they were the first alcoholics 
to have left a record of begging for booze in the new world. Freezing temperatures soon forced the pilgrims back onto the ship. As a Christmas peace offering, Captain Jones served a modicum of beer to each of the pilgrims, the last most would ever taste. Half would perish before the Mayflower pulled anchor and sailed away on a fine spring day, leaving the beerless pilgrims behind. In terms of alcohol, the voyage of the Mayflower was a fiasco. The liquor fiasco with the Mayflower caused the foreigners to redouble their efforts to establish a local supply of liquor. The colonists wanted both beer and hard liquor, since beer was the common beverage of adults and children alike. Hard liquor was used as a libation. Both beer and whiskey were so highly desired that great effort and resources were invested to establish a flow of both kinds of booze. The colonists at Roanoke, for example, tried to establish a brewery in 1584 before they went missing. The Dutch had a brewery in Lower Manhattan by 1612, and Captain George Thorpe, shown in the picture here, a colonist and to Virginia in 1620 and an Episcopal minister, described the challenges of growing and malting barley in the heat of the Virginia summer. But he conceded he had found an alternative grain. Quote, we have found a way to make so good drink of Indian corn. I have diverse times refused to drink good, strong English beer and chose to drink that, close quote. Breweries were run at Prim Plymouth Colony in Jamestown, although not until 1621. There are still breweries in all these places and more. However, despite the fact that George Thorpe made a so good drink of Indian corn, there are now very few brewers of corn beer in the United States. Kaboom! By using the technology developed to distill whiskey in Europe, the colonists were able to begin making white lightning across the colonies, and white lightning production exploded. Then, in about 1650, a scant 30 years, after George Thorpe distilled the first batch of American white lightning, distillers in the West Indies began to produce rum from molasses and sugar. Colonists adopted the use of rum immediately, and rum sales outpaced the sale of white lightning made from Indian corn. A typical colonial rum punch, perhaps the one served in the bowl in the etching, combined rum, cognac, Batavia Arak, lemon juice, lemon zest, sugar, black tea, hot water, and a grating of nutmeg. The ingredients were muddled together and allowed to sit to combine the flavors, and these punches were drunk in copious amounts. Our merry swilling founders understood the value of liquor as a tool of politics. After losing an election for a seat in the House of Burgesses in 1755, George Washington redoubled his effort for the 1757 election and by, quote, swilling the planters with bumbo, close quote, he won the election handily. His campaign workers handed out 144 gallons of whiskey, punched beer, and other spirits on election day. In return, he got 331 votes, about one vote for each half gallon of booze dispensed by campaign workers. Washington was a heavy drinker, and observations about his intoxication were not uncommon. For example, in 1785, a close friend reported that Washington became quite merry after drinking champagne. Others observed that Washington drank quite a bit of imported Madeira, a wine that improved with sea transport and was fortified by the addition of brandy. Washington was the largest distiller of rye whiskey in North America. 
he produced upwards of 11,000 gallons during the last year of his life. Plantation workers and enslaved workers at Mount Vernon received a weekly whiskey ration as part of their wages. Evidence points to George Thorpe as being the first American colonist to distill white lightning in 1620, but he certainly was not the last. It is doubtful that he was aware that he was riding the leading edge of a sweeping tide of history, and the name of that tide is rum. By 1650, rum was being distilled from molasses and sugar in the West Indies. The climate there is hot and humid, and that made large-scale distillation of rum problematic. Eventually, the cooler climate of Rhode Island was settled upon as ideal for distillation, and subsequently, a million gallons of molasses was transported into the colonies every year to make rum. The opening of North America for settlement and the subsequent large-scale production of rum initiated a worldwide flush of capitalism and soon the number of voyages carrying trade goods between Western Europe, the Horn of Africa, the East Coast of North America, and the West Indies topped 10,000 voyages. Rhode Island became the most important and largest producer of rum. Rhode Island was a Northern colony, but it primed the pump for the enslaved human trade when it was discovered that the smaller Rhode Island vessels could travel farther upriver to trade for enslaved humans than the larger boats, and that African chiefs who sold enslaved human beings preferred rum made with the Rhode Island recipe. Interestingly, we're left with a mystery here. The Rhode Island recipe for rum has been lost over time, and so until it is found again, we are unlikely to know what was so appealing to the African chieftains about Rhode Island rum. It would be a mistake to think that all rum made in the colonies was exported to Africa in exchange for enslaved human beings. Colonists were dependent on booze and they kept enough rum to meet the needs of the average colonist who drank a whopping 7.3 ounces of rum daily in addition to their beer. The legacy of rum production has persisted. As late as the 1900s, large quantities of molasses were still being shipped to the north to be distilled into ethyl alcohol despite prohibition. One such molasses storage tank collapsed in Boston in 1919 and the resulting flood killed 21 and maimed another 150 innocent victims. We are also reminded of the economic bonds still felt by the people of the West Indies by the song Rum and Coca-Cola, popularized by the Andrews sisters, in which the sexual servicing of American servicemen by indigenous mothers and daughters is the acceptable norm. The words of the song say, out on Manzanella Beach, GI romance with native peach, all night long make tropic love, next day sit in hot sun and cool off, drinking rum and Coca-Cola, go down to Point Kumana, both mother and daughter, working for the Yankee dollar. It's a fact, man. It's a fact. In order to put drinking in colonial times into perspective, it might be useful to look at the drinking habits of some of our founding fathers. Of course, it's not fair to judge their actions by today's standards, but these men must have been made of stern stuff to drink as much as they did. We've already talked a little bit about George Washington. He was notable for his bad teeth, and it's said that he drank an opium tea made from the opium poppies that he grew at Mount Vernon. He also took laudanum, a mixture of opium, alcohol, and morphine. Washington may have been dependent upon a deep red wine fortified with brandy called Madeira, as he was said to drink up to four glasses every afternoon. Washington is said to have visited the Schuylkill Fish House in Philadelphia, where the punch he drank so afflicted him that he retired to his bed for three days. 
Those three days are said to be the only days in Washington's entire adult life when he made no entry in his diary. If our valiant general were alive today, he would probably be able to seek treatment for binge drinking and perhaps for alcoholism. John Adams, America's first vice president and the second president, was fond of drinking beer, wine, rum, and cider. This successor to Washington was such an excessive drinker that he was known to have started out each day with a large amount of hard cider for breakfast. One wonders if the famous breakfast scene from Taxi Driver in which Robert De Niro pours whiskey and sugar over a bowl of cereal before digging in was derived from the habits of President John Adams. Thomas Jefferson, America's third president, was another fan of opium poppies, and he grew them at his mansion in Monticello. He was also too known to have used quinine to help relieve his frequent headaches, and he used laudanum to treat severe diarrhea, a problem that later played a significant role in his demise. Jefferson is known to have lifted a glass of Madeira to toast the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and again a short time later, to toast the inauguration of the first president, George Washington. Jefferson, by today's standards, seems like a prime candidate for dual diagnosis rehab treatment. James Madison, the fourth president of the United States and the drafter of the Bill of Rights, was known to guzzle a pint of whiskey every day. Even though drinking was common in the late 18th century, as alcohol was considered safer to consume than water, a pint a day was still considered quite excessive. But one has to give a tip of the hat to Madison to surviving to the age of 85 after 65 years of drinking a maintenance dose of a pint of whiskey a day. Benjamin Franklin is the last founding father I'm going to touch upon. And although this founding father's image is often linked to beer and breweries, Franklin did not like drunkenness and believed it to be a, quote, very unfortunate vice, close quote. It seems that all of, the found, of all the founding fathers, Franklin would have been the one to intervene and help a friend or family member in need of alcohol treatment. In colonial America, the role of the tavern was so well-defined that in Massachusetts, a tavern was called the Ordinary. The Ordinary was the hub of social and political life. The first Ordinary in America was opened in Boston by Samuel Cole on March 4, 1634, to great acclaim, and a clamoring for more public ordinaries followed. The General Court of Massachusetts responded to the demand by ruling in 1656 that towns that did not support a public tavern would be fined. The appointment of the public ordinary spread across the colonies. Tun Tavern near Quantico, Virginia, was the place where the founders of the U.S. Marine Corps met and made their plans for mobilization. The Bonnet Tavern in Pennsylvania was the place where the leaders of the Whiskey Rebellion met to make their plans. In the taverns of colonial America, free black men could enter to provide entertainment. Ordinaries were known for the liberties their patrons enjoyed. Men and women could exchange affection and people sometimes drank until they could drink no more. People enjoyed beer, whiskey, and punch made according to various recipes. They danced, sang, and enjoyed performances. They smoked and ate meals and travelers could find a bed for the night. Alcohol addiction was a problem in colonial times. Alcohol flowed freely, and even children drank beer when they stopped nursing. People began to drink alcohol instead of water as a way to avoid the problems that arise when there's no public sanitation. Northern Europe was sanitation free at this time, although Paris had been maintaining a public sewer since the mid 1300s. Europeans brought their filthy habits with them and soon polluted any water source they were near. Native people preserved the purity of their water sources for thousands of years, 
but European colonists began to foul their water when the first pilgrim pooped on the riverbank. After that, they suffered as they had in Europe, where they faced a constant threat from cholera, dysentery, and typhoid fever. The European solution was to ferment all liquids and stay drunk around the clock. Later, the introduction of tea, which required boiling water to prepare, sterilized the water and made tea safe to drink. By the year 1791, the fledgling United States government was flat broke. Treasurer Ander Alexander Hamilton looked around, saw how much whiskey people were drinking, and proposed a whiskey tax. The provisions of the tax bill called for producers of large amounts of whiskey to pay six cents a gallon or less and for producers of small batches of whiskey to pay nine cents per gallon. The American farmers who grew grain to make small batch whiskey were furious, and a general insurrection followed that proved to be the largest armed insurrection among American citizens until the Civil War. Three years in, in 1794, Washington sent 13,000 federal troops to Western Pennsylvania to quell the armed confrontation. He was concerned that the troops be provided with an adequate supply of booze. He said, quote, send a sufficient quantity of spirits with the army to furnish modest supplies to the troops. Close quote. In the end, there were 20 arrests, no convictions, and the whiskey tax still stands. Johnny Appleseed, a.k.a. John Chapman, turned 20 years old when George Washington sent 13,000 troops to put down the Whiskey Rebellion. Hmm. No slight advance. There it is. Chapman roamed the area now called by the state names of Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, planting apple seeds in the hopes they would grow into producing apple trees. The streams and wells of this area regularly went dry at the end of summer, and fatalities resulted. People tried to store liquids to avoid suffering, but sanitary storage was a problem because there was no general knowledge of the existence of microorganisms. When Chapman came to adulthood, the rebellious producers of small lots of whiskey were still at odds with federal government regarding the uneven taxation of whiskey producers based on the number of gallons of whiskey produced. Chapman promoted a legal way around the tax on grain-based alcohol by promoting the production of tax-free Applejack. Surprise, apples grown on trees planted from seeds cannot be eaten fresh or cooked. They are too hard and too acerbic to digest without having to do the green apple two-step. Only trees that have fruiting branches specially grafted onto them can produce eating apples. But hard acerbic apples are perfect for making apple juice. So for booze, we press on. Settlers squeeze the juice from the inedible apples and set it aside for hard times. Natural fermentation com commonly turned it into strongly alcoholic Applejack, which is safe if intoxicating to drink. Applejack saw many a pioneer family happily or drunkenly through the annual drought cycle. Chapman has been lionized as a cultural hero and his contributions to the survival rate of pioneers, pioneers has been celebrated while his contribution to the alcoholism rates in the Midwest has been sanitized, and nowhere so prominently as in the Disney short film that first aired in 48. Disney perpetuated a mistruth 
by implying that Mr. Chapman's apples were produced for cooking and eating, which they weren't. These apples were for squeezing cider. When you watch the film, you will notice that an apple press is prominent in several images, and Disney infers that Mr. Chapman's behavior was godly, but it ignores the alcoholism, the genocide of native peoples, the displacement of native plants in the expansionist words, quote, there is a place out west for you, close quote. John Chapman was a gentleman who was known to talk to the forest animals. He traveled about without regard to his appearance, wearing rags and a fire blackened kettle on his head. It is difficult to imagine John Chapman finding a place in America today, rather than making him a culture hero, they would try to find a placement for treatment of his alcoholism. Johnny Appleseed's legacy of cultural heroism is rooted in opposition to the regulation and taxation of alcoholic beverages. To this day, that opposition is alive and well. And again, we can draw a straight line between the Samalus volcanic explosion of 1257 AD and the existence of NASCAR today. A look at the life of NASCAR hero, Junior Johnson illustrates the point perfectly. In the audio interview with Johnson linked to this presentation, he describes how he grew up in a moonshining family where generations of men made the white lightning and the boys ran it past the government men with their hands out for excise tax money. Junior Johnson competed with his brothers for the fastest trips on steep and winding mountain roads. And if it's possible, I'd like to play this clip by clicking on the still. Here. No, I don't have any control over this, so we'll skip that up. Um, popular media was fascinated with bootleg whiskey and they made heartwarming movies like A Pocket Full of Miracle and Thunder Road, the story of a moonshine runner. The temperance movement advocated total abstinence from alcohol on a moral basis, and it was tied to an anti-immigrant movement that connected increased drinking with the influx of immigrants. It made a strange combination of bedfellows out of federal agents, progressives, Protestants, and Klansmen. Because alcohol was seen as the cause of the problems plaguing Americans at the time, and not as a form of self-medication. Nationwide prohibition lasted from 1920 until 1933. The 18th Amendment, which legal illegalized the manufacture, transportation, and sale of alcohol, was passed by the US Congress in 1917. It took nearly two years, but in 1919, the 18th Amendment was ratified by three quarters of the nation states and it became constitutional. Um, if we could play Lips That Touch Liquor, you can experience uh, the sentiment of a large segment of the American population. Who's like to 
Next slide, please. Popular music has long been a forum where the topic of booze is expected. And even during prohibition, songs about alcohol were produced. Every musical forum seems to have taken up the topic from one of the earliest known professional blues singers, Ma Rainey and her Georgia band, uh, we have a performance of Booze and the Blues, but I'm not sure these are going to work that well without the videos that go with them. So I'll encourage you to get the full version from, uh, from Ken. Yes, let me, let me try to show the video. I think I just need to change the screen that I'm sharing. So if you give me one moment. We're doing Roots of Blues, correct? Yeah, try that one. Television included the topic of alcohol from the beginning, and the networks added alcohol advertising to programming. And eventually, advertisers were prohibited from showing people consuming alcohol. But that's not stopped a plethora of ads. So I wanted to look at a couple of short clips that epitomize the ubiquity of alcohol on television. First up is quarterback Tom Brady chugging a beer with Stephen Colbert. Galassia, do you think you can find that one? 
I'm working on it. Thank you. Let me just find the Tom Brady chugs a beer. <laughs> <laughs> more about the book okay let's talk a little bit this is that was fantastic by the way was it i understand why giselle married you now. <laughs> unbelievable she gets a lot of that unbelievable i'm just gonna leave the jacket off hold on one second i think we've gotta get to the part and your superman diet well, I, yeah, yeah, you're good. I don't eat very often. Like when I was young, I just had the worst diet. Yeah, I think as I've gotten older, it, the diet's improved a lot. So okay. those things I eat much less or yep. far, more, far less often now. Yeah. I'd say cheeseburger, pizza, beer, things like that. Do you, you don't drink beer? Rarely. Damn. <laughs> I was pretty good beer chugger back in the day. You were a good beer chugger? Yeah. Do you want to do you want to chug a beer? I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. Do you want to do you want to do this again? This is are we kids. competing or are we just are we chugging? Is I don't know if you're a competitive guy. Let's try. Okay, let's try. Yeah. Somebody many time? Okay. How do we start this? Okay, so we just click and yeah. go. All right. All right. Okay. Can we spill? Can we spill? We can spill. All right. Ready? I left a little. That was good. That was. That was really good. Oh, well, listen, that's all we have time for, Tom. <laughs> I just wish we could have covered more subjects while you're here. <laughs> well, the book is uh, TB12. Thank you. TB12. The second clip is of the Beverly Hillbillies and Granny crafting a pot of alcohol in the backyard of her mansion. What you cooking, Granny? Done cooked and cool. That's for spring tonic. Mmm, got a dandy head on it this year. <laughs> How come you cooked up such a big batch? You fixing a tonic the whole town of Beverly Hills? That's just a start. Then I'm going to commence on the rest of the country. Everybody? No, just the Democrats and the Republicans. <laughs> they need tonic, do they? I did. They is in such bad shape. One party can't walk, and the other one can't even stand up. Who told you that? They did. I've been watching the TV. The Republicans claim that the Democrats are dragging their feet. And the Democrats come back and say that the Republicans ain't got a leg to stand on. You got to remember, Granny, come election time, them two parties says a lot of things about each other. That's why I ain't taking no chances. I'm tonic in both sides. <laughs> I'm glad to see you ain't partial. <laughs> I'll say this. You get enough of your tonic into them two parties, this country's going to have one rip snort in the election. <laughs> That's why I made it extra strong this year. I figured a little will have to go the wrong way. Now go ahead. Help yourself. Well, I tell you, Granny, uh, you ought to go first. It's your tonic. Yeah. I have been feeling a little stove up lately. Little achy in the joints and not too spry. They're probably city living. Probably. Well, <laughs> here's looking at you, Jed. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> you ain't looking at me. Oh. <laughs> water. <laughs> Tell me, folks are going to talk about this election for years to come. In the last 20 years, 80% of movies show alcohol consumption. Before then, alcohol was no stranger and was often lauded in song. Uh, but it's way over the top now. So alcohol in America is the most commonly abused uh, addictive substance. There are 17,600,000 Americans or 
one in every 12 adults who suffer from alcohol abuse or dependence. There are 5 million more addicted to other things like meth, coke, heroin, pain pills, and other drugs. Um, another 18 million are addicted to tobacco. Let's see, the slides need to advance a couple here. Uh, slide 20 is probably where we should be. So every year, about $2 billion is spent on booze. I mean, is spent on advertising for booze. And the return on that is $253 billion in alcohol sales. Supermarket sales of booze are $4.2 billion every year. In 2017, Americans consumed 67.5 billion 12 ounce beers. And Americans consumed 4.3 billion bottles of wine. We spent 50 billion on alcohol rehab and we lost 44 billion to booze related automobile accidents. We lost 29 million lives in booze-related non-accident deaths. American men, 71% of them drink, and 60% of American women drink. There are 10.5 million heavy drinkers in the United States. I'd like to thank the 29 Palms Historical Society and the Desert Institute for hosting this presentation with a special thanks to you who have maintained inquiring minds in the era of COVID-19. Enjoy this final song, the words of which are a tribute to Maya Well, and tell us how good pulse is for our health, how enjoyable it is to drink, and how it opens hearts and unites people. While you listen, check out the table and see where the plants we are dependent upon for our beverages come from.
because the best <laughs> moments are those with pulque. Thank you so much for that for that very fun presentation and for all the the music and the and the culture and I think that was really an in-depth understanding of not just booze but all the other links that are attached to it in in the rich history of the making of this country there's a lot there's a lot yep i um i realized this when i was teaching a unit on alcohol for american studies classes and i realized my students didn't really know anything about alcohol other than they really liked it <laughs> and, and you know that's a great entry point into getting people excited about history because it's something that they can relate to, right? Well, it's true. And if we were able to muddle through with four severe alcoholics as our first four presidents, it gives me a lot of hope for the future of this <laughs> Yeah, we have, we have room for growth galore. We do. <laughs> and we've proven that, that we can recover from these kinds of things and move forward in a good way, so. Exactly. I think those are those are probably the best lessons right a along the way. Mm -hmm. well, well, um, I'm going to um, make a PDF out of this presentation and all the links should be functioning in the PDF. So perfect. People can yeah. Explore it. yeah, so I highly recommend anybody who uh, I mean, if you could, you probably saw during the presentation, there are tons of little prompts like click here, click there. Um, I think Ellie, you mentioned there's about 10 hours of content that you can just peruse from this presentation. About that, yeah. Everything from a film on how to make pulque from a big agave, how to climb up into the middle of it and cut its heart out uh, all the way to, um, watching Mario Lanza sing operetta, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's 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 all fabulous. So thank you so much for everything you shared. I don't see any questions. Um, so I'm I'm going to wrap up the night. Ellie, do you have any last thoughts that you want to share with the group? Skol. Salud. Nostrovia. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Absolutely. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. No, absolutely. And to everyone who was here today, thank you so much for your contributions, for continuing to support our programming. I'm dropping in the chat a couple of ways to support that if you're not aware of, I highly recommend that you check them out. Um, also, let me drop in the link in case you are, the link, sorry, the email address in case you are interested in donating to receive the presentation PDF of, or PowerPoint so you can browse through those 10 hours of just rich content that Ellie has so wonderfully put together for us. So you just have to email Kevin at desertinstitute at joshuatree.org and he'll help you out to get these materials. That was a fabulous presentation, Ellie. Thank you so much. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you to the Desert Institute and the 29 Palms Historical Society for keeping this series alive. And I will see you here next month. Gracias a todos. Gracias. Bye. Bye-bye.